Hello, Physical Science 21 Elementary Astronomy. This is Professor Ringwald continuing with chapter 27 of Astronomy for Beginners about black holes and relativity. As I've told you in previous classes, nowadays we understand the evolution of single stars surprisingly well. Really, the main two things that determine the differences between stars are their masses and their ages. Low mass stars like the sun live on the main sequence a long time, turn hydrogen into helium with the nuclear fusion reactions in their center. Eventually the heavy stuff, the helium sinks to the bottom and it becomes a red giant and a red supergiant. And a star like the sun with only one solar mass, the mass equal to that of the sun, doesn't have enough energy inside it to ever explode catastrophically like a supernova, but instead they come apart gradually, throwing off a planetary nebula and the central star that you can see in the middle here cools down and becomes a white dwarf. An example of this is the sun. We've seen examples of every step of this evolution. So we're reasonably sure this is the way it goes, how a star like the sun spends its life. But for a star more than about eight times the mass of the sun, uh, since they have more mass, they have more gravity, more temperature, higher temperature and greater pressure in their center. So they burn their nuclear fuel a lot faster instead of a main sequence B, A, F, or G star, a star with a, a mass between eight and 25 times the mass of the sun is an A sequence B or O star. And these last less, much less than 1% of the age of a normal low mass star like the sun being a G main sequence star. They turn into a, either a blue or red uh, supergiant depending on composition, metal poor stars, do it with uh, turn into blue supergiants, metal rich stars like the sun turn into red supergiants. But of course, the sun is a low mass star, so it won't do that at all. But say a massive star with the same composition as the sun will turn into a red supergiant, either will turn into a red supergiant with an iron core. This will eventually collapse and explode in a type two supernova with a horrible little remnant in the middle, a pulsar, which is a rotating magnetized neutron star, they pulse, and eventually they lose their magnetic field and spin down and just turned into a neutron star. An example of this was the star that made the Crab Nebula. And again, we've seen every step in this evolution, so we're reasonably sure we have it right. Stars with masses greater than 25 times the mass of the sun, 25 solar masses or 25 suns, have lives that are nasty, brutish, and short. They burn themselves out so quickly. They live fast and die young. Basically, they're an O-type star on the main sequence with a very strong wind, never holding together per, uh, particularly well, lasting much, much shorter than even the uh, intermediate class stars uh, last. Eventually, the wind is so strong, it throws off all the hydrogen, expels all the hydrogen, so you get a hot helium rich star with a ferocious wind. It collapses, flashes a big flash of gamma rays, a gamma ray burst that will tell you more about uh, next week, and explodes as a supernova. It's a well-known principle in physics and engineering that if you do anything hard enough with a big enough hammer, it'll break. And that's what it does. It basically tears a hole in space and time, referred to as a black hole. And one reason why we think this is true is we've seen steps, we've seen every one of these steps in the evolution. So reasonably sure, yeah, this is the way it goes. Black holes are holes in space where time stops. And to understand these concepts at all, it sounds like I'm spouting pure science fiction. But black holes are one of the more outrageous, surprising predictions of Einstein's general theory of relativity. So we need to know more about Einstein's general theory of relativity. Towards the end of the last class, I told you about some of Einstein's other contributions to science, his basic contributions to quantum mechanics, 
basically how anything's more than a molecule works, how atoms and electrons work. And Einstein essentially invented the special theory of relativity. It was pretty much entirely his own work in 1905. And he got very famous among other, science, uh, among sci other scientists really quick. So he was able to quit his job at the patent office in two years after he published this paper in 1907, published the paper in 1905, and went back to, uh, and went to grad school, finished up his PhD. And for the rest of his life, he had a series of academic appointments. He never once had to mentor a graduate student because he was considered too hot in intellectual property. Uh, he basically was employed doing research for the rest of his life. And after 11 years working on the problem on and on, it's not true that he worked exclusively on the general theory of relativity for 11 years. Any scientist who does that is nuts because you're never really sure whether anything is going to succeed. But he finally did succeed, came up with his general theory of relativity in 1916. Einstein's general theory of relativity is our best theory of gravity. It explains gravity as being curvature of space and time. It sounds like pure science fiction, so let me explain. The idea that space can curve is not such a crazy idea. We live on the surface of Earth, which we know is round. Uh, locally, it looks flat because the Earth is much bigger than we are. But if you travel any distance, you'll eventually come all the way around the Earth. I once, when I was living in England, I uh, flew to Australia and came into traveling from west to east, and which I could see from the sun out of the airplane's window. And I came to Sydney, Australia. And to celebrate, I had lunch in the McDonald's there. And then I went back to England and then I moved to uh, back to the United States. I'm original, I'm American, I'm originally from America. So I moved back to the United States. And the next time I had occasion to go to Australia, I flew from east to west. I flew out through San Francisco into Sydney the other way, which I could see by because I could see the sun through the window of the airliner. And I landed in Sydney, Australia and had lunch in the same McDonald's, sat in the same seat. So yes, I've been around the world. I've also sailed around the world, sailed around the world when I was in the United States Navy. So I can verify, yeah, it is round uh, within 1% of being a sphere. So, but locally, since the earth is much bigger than we are, it looks flat. But if you travel any distance, you see it's round. As covered earlier in this course, the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle had four arguments now known to be correct why he thought the earth was round. So the idea that space can curve is not a crazy idea. We live on the round surface of earth. Isaac Newton assumed that space is fixed, that it's always the same, and that time is absolute. It's always the same, in other words. That turns out not to be true. Albert Einstein, with a special theory of relativity, shows that time depends on your motion. If you travel at a speed very close to the speed of light, time will seem normal for you, but for other people, it will seem to have slowed down very much, at least by your reckoning. Therefore, the image of the astronaut who gets in a spaceship travels to the Andromeda galaxy and comes back, traveling at speeds close to the speed of light. 56 years have gone by for the astronaut. Five million, a year, five million years will have gone uh, by on the Earth, which, of course, was never traveling at a speed close to the speed of light. That was actually Einstein's special theory of relativity. Einstein showed that also, in addition to the space can curve, uh, basically, Einstein's general theory of relativity, standing on one foot with no math, is matter tells space how to curve. So the presence of mass will curve space, and that because space curves because of the presence of mass, this tells matter how to move. The result is basically that things travel along paths exactly 
how they would travel if they were affected by Newton's law of gravity. Newton's law of gravity tells you how gravity works, but it doesn't really tell you what gravity is. This does. It tells you what gravity is. It tells you gravity is curvature of space and the slowing down of time and the presence of mass. It is said that Newton during his lifetime was uh, chided by someone. Someone that says, well, your theory of gravity, um, you know, Newton's law of gravity um, tells you how things move, but it doesn't tell you how gravity works, but it doesn't tell you what gravity is. And Newton is said to have said, it tells you how it works. That, sh that should be enough. And it isn't really. We do want to know why things work. And Einstein solved the problem in 1916. It was general theory of relativity. And it's still our best theory of gravity. It explains gravity as curvature of space and time caused by the presence of mass. Sounds like pure science fiction. Any scientific theory needs to be tested by experiment. Uh, scientific ideas stop being scientific ideas. We can't test them by experiment. If you can't test your scientific idea, your scientific theory by experiment, it quickly turns into a game of let's pretend. So when Einstein published this in 1916, other scientists were very eager to test the idea. And a friend of Einstein's, a uh, British professor by the name of Arthur, Arthur Stanley Eddington, organized a couple of uh, expeditions, one to South America and one to West Africa, to observe what a total solar eclipse that he would know. And a total solar eclipse, as covered earlier in this course, the moon passes between the Earth and the sun and blots out the bright surface of the sun. So for a few minutes there, when the moon is between the Earth and the sun, an astronomer on Earth can see faint stars in the background. And since with the moon and the sun there, uh, one might expect if Einstein's general theory of relativity is right, if gravity is ca does cause curvature of space by the presence of mass, since with two big masses, the moon and the sun, between the Earth and the stars, you would see these stars in places different from where you would expect to see them ordinarily. And this was observed. Uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity predicts that gravity can bend starlight because starlight passes on the shortest distance between two points, which on a plane is a straight line, but on a sphere is not a straight line. It's a great circle. That's why when you fly from Los Angeles to London, it takes you over the North Pole, because that's actually the, the shortest way to do it. The Earth is not flat, it's round. And likewise, when mass from the moon and the sun are curving space, uh, light from the star will not travel in a, light from stars will not, uh, on the, in the in back of this, will not travel in straight lines. They'll curve. So an astronomer looking from Earth with a telescope and photographing will see the stars misplaced. And that was exactly what was observed during the total solar eclipse expedition in 1919. And Einstein became very, very famous. Since 1905, when he published his uh, paper on the special theory of relativity and also his other papers, one of which got him the Nobel Prize, it was the paper that gave us digital electronics. He was famous to other scientists, but in 1919, with the uh, observations showing that his general theory of relativity really does work, space apparently does curve because of the presence of mass and time slows down because of it. He became the most famous scientist of the 20th century, as famous as a movie star. How he handled his fame, uh, people still argue about. Some people who knew him said clearly he enjoyed being famous and he cultivated it. Other people said he didn't like being in the middle of a crowd like he has shown here. But nevertheless, he became really, really, really famous. And the term Einstein for somebody as smart, who was smart, came into common everyday use and is still in everyday use. Okay, well, in 1916, a different theoretical physicist by the name of Carl Schwarzschild 
Red Einstein's paper on general relativity, actually he published several of them, but wrote, okay, so Red Einstein's uh, papers on general relativity and realized that they made a rather startling prediction that if you had enough mass and a small enough volume, it would curve space enough to tear a hole in space. And we call these things nowadays black holes. A black hole is black because nothing can escape from a black hole, not even light. So if I had a black hole right here, I promise I won't break one, but if I had a black hole right here, you would see a perfectly black object. And if you tried to take a picture of it with your camera flash, it wouldn't help. The light from the camera flash would go into the black hole and not come out, so still look perfectly black. Why a black hole is black, I trust you will remember the concept of escape speed covered earlier in this course when I was telling about Newton's laws of gravity. Namely that, as Newton figured out, if you fire a cannon, shot, fire a, cop, a shot from a cannon, it goes so far before it hits the, you know, falls down and hits the earth. If you fire a shot from a cannon faster, it'll go farther, but again, hit the earth. And this is all because of Newton's second law, force is equal to mass times acceleration. A bigger force will give you more acceleration with the same mass cannonball, so it'll go farther. If you fire a shot fast enough, though, it'll go all the way around the Earth, and you better move the cannon out of the way because it'll hit the back of the cannon. And if there were no air, if, if there were no um, air resistance, it would keep going around and around. And that is, that would happen at orbital speed, which is about 17,000. 500 miles per hour or 7.8 kilometers per second. This is how fast a satellite has to go to stay in orbit around the Earth. If it goes any slower, it'll eventually fall to the Earth. It is not true that what goes up must come down. If your satellite is moving at orbital speed, it'll keep orbiting the Earth forever. And uh, Orbiting is very much like throwing yourself at the ground and missing. Orbiting is like throwing yourself at the ground and missing. But of course, a well-known principle in physics and engineering is that if you hit anything hard enough with a big enough hammer, it'll break. If you fire a cannon, shot from a cannon, so that it goes a square root of two times faster than orbital speed, it'll reach escape speed. 25,000 miles an hour or 11 kilometers per second. And it will be going, your shot will be going so fast, it will completely escape the gravity of Earth. Again, if your shot is going less fast than this, it'll go into orbit around the Earth. But if it's going equal to or greater than escape speed, it will completely escape the gravity of Earth. This is why the Apollo astronauts, those few who are still alive, are still the fastest men alive because their great big Saturn V moon rocket propelled them to this escape speed so they could break free of the Earth's gravity and head out to the moon. The point is nothing can escape from a black hole, not even light, because a black hole's escape speed is greater than the speed of light in empty space, lowercase c. The escape speed of a black hole is greater than the speed of light. And Einstein's special theory of relativity shows that time slows down as you approach the speed of light. You can't travel faster than the speed of light because time would have to stop. And astronomers have looked hard, but have never seen anything in space that travels faster than light. There have been a couple or three false alarms over the years, but further observations show, no, that was wrong or they were illusions. The fact is, we've never seen anything travel faster than light. We have good reason to think that nothing can, because time would have to stop. Um, so nothing can escape, escape from a black hole, not even light, exactly because a black hole's escape speed is greater than the speed of light. So a black hole would be perfectly black. Any light going into it would not come out. And the black hole is a hole because so much mass and such a small volume would make the curvature space approach infinity. It therefore literally tears a hole in space. Therefore, time stops in a black hole. If you were to drop a clock into a black hole, you would see the second hand going slower and slower as it, as it fell into the black hole. And John Archibald Wheeler, 
who had been Richard Feynman's PhD thesis advisor, um, is credited with having coined the phrase black hole, but in fact, he didn't. What happened was that in 1967, he was giving a talk at a scientific conference about totally, co totally collapsed self-gravitating objects. And as he said, you can only say totally collapse self-gravitating objects so many times before you start to wonder, might there be a better name for these things? And he said this over the microphone, it's a large conference. And somebody in the audience said, how about black holes? That was it. They're black and they're holes, they're black holes. So he got the credit for it, but he didn't actually do it. Nobody knows to this day who actually thought of it. If nobody had thought of it, we might call them frozen stars because they're frozen in time. Time stops in a black hole. Again, you drop a clock into a black hole, you would see the second hand going slower and slower. Uh, but it's black hole. Somebody did think of black hole. I would love to see that written into a Doctor Who episode. You know, the Doctor uh, parks his time machine uh, outside, stumbles into this normally disorganized matter. Oh, how about black hole? Well, nobody really knows. Uh, but black holes do exist, and how astronomers have found them is an astonishing story. A misconception about, about black holes is that they don't suck. Black holes are often made out in science fiction to be these horrible things that drag poor starships to their doom, like quicksand drags adventures to their doom and bad adventure films. And neither does that. Real quicksand does not suck you under. Real quicksand is basically just dirt and sand that has so much water in it. Actually, it's water with so much dirt and sand in it. Also, sometimes clay and um, salt. It looks like dirt. And yes, you can step in it. And if you lose your head and struggle, you, for, you might uh, sink farther and you could drown in it. But if you don't lose your head, you can wiggle your way out of it, especially if you don't mind losing a pair of shoes or pants. It's possible to get out of quicksand. Um, just get out of it easily, easier way out of it. Don't struggle. That'll make things worse. So uh, real quicksand does not suck, nor, nor do black holes. It's just a gravity field, something falling down. Only with most gravity fields, you eventually hit something. With a black hole, it just keeps falling, as far as we know, forever. Where it winds up, we do not know. It is a hole in this universe, leading out of space and time as we know it right now. Where it goes, we don't know, but the point is, as far as we know, a black hole is bottomless. Any other gravity field does have a bottom. Stephen Hawking originally got famous before he was too terribly disabled. He was, of course, famous uh, later in life because he overcame this terrible disability. And uh, as he said, it really didn't prevent him from doing very much that he wanted to do. On his 60th birthday, he went up on a hot air balloon. He subsequently... Um, uh, flew uh, in a jet that uh, achieved zero gravity, and he had a wife and three kids, and never did get the Nobel Prize, but uh, lots of people don't do that. Um, black holes aren't so black, he pointed out. He was the first to investigate the thermodynamics of black holes, why, how they radiate heat and information how they suck up heat and information to the space and whether or not they radiate. And he found out that actually they're not so black. They can evaporate. So here is the image of some advanced people. I don't know whether they're human or not, doesn't tell you, but they're about to recharge their starship with this thing that they've built around a black hole, extracting energy from the black hole. How exactly to do that is left as an exercise to the student. Wormholes may provide a way to travel faster than light by taking shortcuts through higher dimensions. In Star Trek, this is called warp drive. In Star Wars, this is called hyperspace. I like to point out that this is an interesting idea, but it's still science fiction. Yeah, I took that course in general relativity when I was in grad school. And yeah, 
there are solutions of Einstein's field equations where if you were to dive down a black hole, you would come out somewhere else. Or maybe a powerful starship could make a black hole in front of it and dive down it and come out elsewhere in the universe with the effect that you would be traveling faster than light, despite what Einstein's general, rather specialty or relative tell you. There's still science fiction, still unproved, still no experiments to actually prove that this theory is true. And until somebody does put one together um, and actually run it and actually demonstrate, uh, yeah, this is the way it works, uh, it'll still be science fiction. Uh, yeah, well, maybe it could work, but uh, let me just uh, say that, um, okay, so you want to dive down a black hole and see if you come out uh, uh, somewhere else in the universe. Uh, okay, uh, fine. I'll watch you. I'll watch you. Be very interesting. Okay. Why do we think? In the book, Astronomy for Beginners, in chapter uh, 27, there is a um, section. If a black hole is a hole in space, where does it lead? The answer is we don't know. Might uh, lead to elsewhere in the universe. There's another section that says, why are we so sure that black holes are real and that we have found them? Well, again, theoretical prediction by Albert Einstein in 1916. Einstein himself didn't take it very seriously. Um, it wasn't until many years later, 1971, that astronomers would finally find an object that really does look like a black hole because of the X-rays it radiates. Uh, theorists had worked out if you were to, if there were a black hole that was eating a companion star. So star from the gas from the star is being dumped in the black hole and it doesn't fall straight down because the two stars are orbiting each other. So it goes sideways in a whirlpool and the gas from the whirlpool eventually uh, falls into the black hole. And such a thing would radiate x-rays because as the gas goes down the black hole, the black hole's gravity compresses it very much. And by the ideal gas law, which you may remember from high school chemistry, it would get very, very hot. Hot enough to make x-rays. A thousand times hotter than the sun, therefore making x-rays, which have wavelengths a thousand times shorter than visible light, like the sun may, may, may be, may, mainly radiates, and a thousand times uh, higher energy. And the X-ray spectrum of Cygnus X-1, observed by uh, NASA spacecraft for the first time in 1971, really does look exactly like the theoretical prediction for what the X-ray spectrum of a black hole should look like. And therefore, a lot of astronomers said, this is it. We finally discovered a black hole in space and time. But Carl Sagan used to like to say, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. If you want to claim that you have actually found a black hole in space and in time, a black hole in the universe, you really want more different kinds of evidence and more convincing evidence than just a good looking X-ray spectrum. So for about 25 years, from 1971 to the mid 1990s, ast astronomers loved to argue um, why are we so sure that black holes are real? And have, have we really found them? The argument ended in about 1994 when a friend of mine, Jorge Casares, Jorge is from Spain, uh, found a black hole that really is convincing. And since then, at least 59 other black holes have been identified by how their gravity affects the companion star. You may wonder, how do you find a perfectly black object in space, which is perfectly black? And the answer is by the horrible things that a black hole does to any stars that it is eating. Any stars nearby it will be very much affected by the, um, by the um, gravity of the black hole. And Cygnus X1, turns out to have a companion star, but they're almost face on in their orbit. So it was really not so easy to measure the mass of the black hole that way. Jorge found one called V44 Cygni, 
uh, that is nearly edge on and much easier to measure these masses. And the mass of the black hole in V44 Cygni had to be at least 6.0 solar masses. The most massive neutron star possible is 3.0 plus or minus 0 0.3 solar masses. So Jorge's black hole, at least 6.0 plus or minus 1.0 solar masses, had to be a black hole, could not be anything else could not possibly be a neutron star. And there was much rejoicing. Here I am uh, having lunch with him in 1993. Uh, I was asking him, what are you drinking in the middle of the day, Jorge? It was water. Um, that um, I, later this year, I did observations myself with an infrared uh, telescope and camera in Arizona. And I gave them to a grad student I was working with, Tariq Shabazz, who gave them to Jorge. And they were able to show that the compact component uh, in V404 Cygni uh, has a mass of 7.0 plus or minus 1.0 solar masses. Definitely a black hole, not just a lower limit, but an actual measurement. And there has been much rejoicing ever since. Um, and many of these others have turned up, many others have turned up. And now that we know, know what to look for, we see them all over the universe. For many years, just about every textbook in the world said that we know that black holes exist because of how their gravity affects um, companion stars. We don't know of any black holes that don't have companion stars. Well, that's no longer true. A friend of mine at Notre Dame, Dave Bennett, basically repeatedly with digital cameras took pictures of lots and lots and lots of stars, crowded fields of stars in the Milky Way and how by how some of them vary in brightness. Uh, that would be how the gravitational lensing, how the curvature of space and time, like in the 1990 eclipse, makes stars wink on and off. And many of these have been found. Uh, microlensing events where a black hole moves between Earth and a star and causes a star to change in brightness in a, in a, um, in a uh, predictable fashion. So it's no longer true that black holes have to have companion stars to be detectable. You can detect them by what their gravity does to the light of stars farther away from them that they coincidentally pass in front of and you increase the chances of a, co of a coincidence if you look at a crowded field of stars, lots and lots and lots of stars, typically about 10 million stars in an image. And uh, there's good software to actually find these events. A friend of mine at Harvard, Mike Garcia, actually he's at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. now, did a systematic study of the ones shown to have black holes and the ones to show that they have neutron stars. And sure enough, the ones that have black holes are systematically not as bright, systematically fainter than the ones with neutron stars because they have something black inside them about the size of a black hole, about the size of the short shield radius, the event horizon, the point of no return of the black hole inside of which the escape velocity is greater than light. And that's very encouraging because it would have been embarrassing if that were not the case. Science makes predictions and if the, any scientific idea must make predictions, you can test by experiment. And if the, it fails a test, that's in, that indicates that the idea is wrong. So it didn't prove the idea wrong, but then again, it was quickly pointed out that uh, a black cup of coffee and a black cat are also black, but they are not holes in space and time. So this supports that there is something black in these systems that we think are black holes, which is encouraging, but doesn't prove that black holes exist. Some of the best evidence is this direct image of a black hole in the center of, a ma of, a, of an active galaxy called M87. Reasonably sure that just about all big galaxies have big black holes in their center. And this is the nearest one with a big enough black hole that by using lots of radio telescopes spread out across the earth and connected together so you can synthesize an image that is as clear as if you had a radio telescope uh, as big as halfway, half the size of earth, 
you could actually beat the diffraction limit, which I told you about in chapters 12 and 13, and actually get an image uh, as if you had a telescope that big. And sure enough, there is a black hole. So this direct image of a black hole in the center of the galaxy M87 was taken by the Event Horizon Telescope, an interferometer with telescopes in North and South America, Europe and Hawaii. The black object inside the bright ring of gas is the size predicted for the event horizon of that black hole. So you see something that looks just like a black hole. You know, the old saying, if it looks like a duck and it swims like a duck and it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it may be a duck. So a black hole with the black part being the same size as predicted for the mass that you could measure by star by tracking stars moving around it. Yeah, it really is starting to look like a real black hole. Another independent bit of evidence was that stars, really massive stars, about 60 solar masses, when they end their lifetimes, they may not explode as supernovae. And this apparently was one of them. It apparently just disappeared. Did this red supergiant star collapse directly into a black hole without a supernova? Several of these events have been seen recently. So um, again, I may have to redo that, um, that, um, that illustration I had of the three different evolution of the three of low mass stars, medium uh, mass stars, and high mass stars. The highest mass stars apparently pair instability supernovae uh, might, uh, for some masses, really high masses, just collapse directly into a black hole without making without making a supernova at all. Um, these are rare. Stars that massive are very rare. So these are rare, but the new generation of automated telescopes uh, is turning up all kinds of strange, rare things, precisely because they soak up data like a vacuum cleaner. They, the Vera Rubin telescope, uh, if uh, used the way we used to use telescopes, will generate 10 million events a night. No human being can absorb that much information. We're gonna to have to figure out new ways of, uh, of, uh, of handling the information. Astronomy has reached the era of big data like many other fields have. Therefore, all the young astronomers are learning Python programming to deal with this and data science and machine learning to deal with this torrent of data coming from the new generation of automated telescopes. After many years of rapid development, astronomical instrumentation may finally be approaching infancy in its ability to actually observe the universe the way it is. But I wouldn't bet money on that. Another direct uh, observation of black holes was that starting in 2015, the LIGO project found gravitational waves from two merging black holes. The LIGO project is, was the first successful gravitational wave detector. It detects waves of gravity predicted by Einstein. But in 1934, he realized they were so weak, they probably would never have been detected. Well, 100 years of technology development uh, since 1916, when the prediction was originally made, has paid off. They, uh, modern technology is um, sensitive enough. The laser interferometer uh, there are two of them, one in Hanford, Washington, and one in Livingston, uh, Louisiana, funnily enough, Britney Spears' hometown, and another one, the Virgo detector in Italy and Europe, and another one in Germany, GEO, and one under construction in Japan, and one under construction in India. They can sense these really faint events. Two black holes just about anywhere in the universe merging together will shake the whole universe, make gravitational waves that pass through the whole universe. Uh, it's an even more detection, direct detection of black holes because they make exactly the signal predicted for them. Remember when I told you, when I told you earlier, since a black hole is a hole in space and a hole in time, meaning that time slows down in a black hole, if you were to drop a clock into a black hole and watch the second hand, you would see it going slower and slower. My favorite bit of evidence for why black holes really do exist and astronomers have found them was that this observation has essentially be, been made. 
So remember how a clock will slow down as it falls into a black hole. This was first observed in 1997 using waves and gas going down the black hole. Uh, a couple of friends of mine uh, from China who, for some reason, working for NASA, which always puzzled me because um, I thought NASA hired only U.S. citizens. Well, maybe they maybe they were naturalized. I don't know. But anyway, they're working at, at, at NASA Goddard Flight uh, Space Flight Center and using a NASA spacecraft, the uh, Rossi X-ray Timing Explorer, and doing observations uh, with it and observing waves in the gas in the whirlpool going down a black hole in V404 Cygni. And sure enough, the waves spread out exactly in the way predicted for how they should spread out in time as they go down a black hole into the strong gravity of the black hole, that the black hole's gravity affects space and time, curbs space and slows down time in exactly the way predicted by Einstein in general theory of relativity. It's striking. And so the observation of dropping a clock into a black hole and watching the second hand tick slower and slower as it, uh, watching the second hand go slower and slower, watching the clock tick slower and slower as it travels into the black holes, deeper and deeper into the black hole's gravity field. That's been done. And it follows the prediction, confirms the prediction of Einstein's general theory of relativity perfectly. Also, in 2019, how the black hole in this, the same black hole in B4 for Cygni drags the space around it as, as it spins. You know, when you stir a drink with ice cubes in it, the ice cubes get swirled around in the fluid in the drink, just like the uh, fluid does. Uh, this effect called frame dragging uh, around a black hole, as a black hole spins, gravity will drag space and time around it. That's been observed. In both cases, observations match, match the prediction of general relativity perfectly. So again, if it looks like a duck and it walks like a duck and it swims like a duck, and it quacks like a duck. It's very likely to be a duck. So we are seeing with black holes. One of Einstein's, and I, one of my, and I, one of Einstein's most surprising predictions. Let me stop there for this class.